post on them. Here we are for the Holy Mass on this Saturday before the first Sunday of Lent here in New Hampshire. And we are, we're grateful for the family to open their home to have the Mass here in your home, gathering people from all over in this uh, the cold uh, North New England. So we enter also into the sacred season of Lent. We receive the ashes a few days later, but that's okay. We begin the sacred time repenting of our sins. That's the main thing. To really detest our sins. To confess them to the Sacred Heart of Jesus in the Sacrament of Confession. And uh, where the blood of Christ strengthens your soul, heals the wounds of sin, and, and transforms each one of you as an image of Christ himself. More than was given to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were definitely created in the state of sanctifying grace, but they lost it. And after 930 years of repentance and penance, they died. 930 years old was, was Adam. So he is a saint. They certainly <coughs> saved their soul. But by sanctifying grace, God, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, dwell in the soul. The soul becomes another heaven where God reigns as, as the king. And he wants this for each of us. Our souls, says St. John the Chrysostom, each one of our souls is like a battlefield. Someone owns that field. And it's up to us who owns it. We're born slaves of the devil. We're born his servants because we're born in original sin. But when Christ at baptism, his blood washed away this, the chains and the blackness of the soul and filled the soul with the presence of the Holy Trinity, then that battlefield became the territory of Christ the King and the angels and the whole, the blessed Trinity. So ever since we reached the age of reason, it's up to us who rules the battlefield of our soul. And if we are slaves of sin, slaves especially of mortal sin, the devil rules. And we are genuine slaves. And there's no more cruel tyrant than Satan. We read in the Gospels, the, the man who came to our Lord, the centurion, please, Lord, come and touch and cure my son, because he is paralyzed and he is male torquetur in Latin. He's terribly suffering. Now Christ cured his son by his words. He didn't even have to go and touch him. But he was, he was terribly tortured, <coughs> physically. But those who live in sin are more spiritually tortured. The devil is cruel. And they know no peace. The Holy Ghost says those who dwell and live in sin, they do not know peace in their soul. Their, peace is, their soul is never at rest. There's always the, the lack of peace because there's no peace with God. How can there be peace if there's no peace with God? And the definition of peace is tranquility of order. A house is in peace, says the Holy Scripture, when things are in order. The father is head of the family. The wife honors and respects him. She does her duties as wife. He does his duties as husband. They love each other. The children share in this this extension of love between the parents and, and, and the adoration given to God in the home. There is a peace in the home where God reigns, where the Sacred Heart reigns. But where he doesn't reign, there's no real peace. There's no real peace. So there cannot be real peace, real love, real joy, real harmony, which all the modern world uses these words, but empty of Christ, that's exactly what they are, empty. So our souls, the, the poor, poor, that's why the Virgin Mary said, pray for poor sinners, because they're tortured in this life, and they're tortured for all eternity in hell. And if we live in sin and choose to live in sin, we already live a tortured life. There's no peace for the sinner, says the Holy Ghost. They might smile, they might laugh, but it's shallow. 
and it's just a facade. But the peace that Christ gives is quite impressive. The priests, we always deal with death, we always deal with the dying, and uh, every priest is always impressed at the great peace of those who die, friends of our Lord. How precious is the death of the, of the saints, says the Holy Ghost. How precious, precious and how precious in the eyes of God are the death of his saints. And I've seen two people really suffering in the hospital beds or at home, really suffering. But there's a great peace in their soul. And, you know, there are many people who are full of health, but there's an agitation in their soul. So, what determines who reigns in our battlefield of our, of our soul is our choice. And it's who we choose to be our king. And to be a slave of God, says St. Gregory the Great, is to be truly free. Christ himself says that truth sets you free. And he is the truth. So to love our Lord and obey him and really seek to follow him, and really seek, like Mary Magdalene, to embrace all that our Lord is, who is truly God, and with him the Father and the Holy Ghost, uh, to chase after him, to desire to see the face of God, to long with the longing of the Holy Ghost, the joyful longing that St. Benedict speaks of during Lent, when we take up our penances in food and drink, or sleep, or in matters of speaking or joking, in the monastery, of course, uh, that tells you the monastery is a joyful place because St. Benedict, Benedict has to tell the monks during Lent, take it easy. Don't, don't be uh, joking all the time. And um, because it shows what a joyful place it really is. Men, an army given for Christ the King. The whole world used to be speckled with monasteries. And that was the spine, that was the backbone of the church, the contemplative orders of monks and nuns. As Catholics, we want a monastery in every state of our United States that would bring great graces on the world. And the, the soul, the soul, this is what we want to surrender completely to our Lord and to the Blessed Mother, to give Christ our soul. And he says it himself, my father is a farmer. My father is a farmer, and this farmer is Almighty God. And if we give our soul to him to take care of and work with him, he will bear fruit. And the best garden that ever, ever, ever was is the one foretold in Ezekiel chapter 44, where he sees this garden where there's no doorway, no window to this garden. It's walled up on all four sides. It's a garden enclosed. And in this garden, it's filled with the most fragrant flowers, the most delicious fruits, no weeds at all, no thorns at all. Imagine that, you who garden. And this garden is filled with the light of the Holy Ghost. And this garden is a Virgin Mary. No man has entered this garden because her virginity was intact. And St. Joseph took the vow of chastity, Our Lady took the vow of chastity, before they were even married. And St. Joseph respected that vow, and he kept his own. So the Protestants are dead wrong, and they even blaspheme when they dare to say that the Virgin Mary had other children. That's pure blasphemy, that they both kept their vows. And so the Virgin Mary is this garden enclosed. But our garden of our soul, well, we got a lot of work to do, don't we? We got weeds continually growing. Once you pull out one weed, you got another one. You got a bunch of other ones. We're always at work until the day we die. And St. Francis de Sales says, self-love will die 15 minutes after we're buried. So we are really wounded. We are really lepers. We are really sick. We are really poor beggars before God. That is what we are. And Mother Church impresses this on us, especially in, Ad, in this time of Lent. We wear, we put on ashes, ashes of repentance. And the colics of the Mass, read them. Every day there's a Mass. 
So we fast a little more from food and drink, but Mother Church fills you with the banquet, the feast of the, the Holy Ghost treasures, the bread of heaven, the words of God and his grace. Every day there's a special mass, a gospel, an epistle, and the whole, the whole set of prayers. So we feast on that. And throughout Lent, you're going to see the prayers of the church. What are they? Now, all these prayers were dropped by Vatican II, by the new Mass. Every reference to man being depraved. We, are, we need penance. We need to turn back to God for our sins. We need tears of repentance. That we are depraved. We, are, we need castigation of the flesh. Castigation of the flesh to punish the body. Because our Lord himself says, why? If we don't do penance, we shall all likewise perish. And it's the Holy Catholic Church, Mother Church, we call her, because she's truly our mother. And in her wisdom, and I speak of the Catholic Church, not the conciliar church of Vatican II. We refuse this church. It's a false, phony church. We have Pope Francis, but he's head over two churches. As, as is often said, in the 1500s, you had one pope over, excuse me, you had two or three popes in the time of the 1400s, in the time of St. Vincent Ferrer and St. Catherine of Siena. And St. Vincent Ferrer actually followed and supported the anti-pope, thinking he was the pope. It was a rough time. But you had two or three popes over one church. Today we've got two churches under one pope. And this one pope is as confused as the wind in a storm. And he, he holds the, the reign of Christ. He holds the seat of Peter. He is Christ's vicar, vicar. He's Peter's successor. But he is giving all his weight and support to the, the conciliar church. He even said recently, Catholics should not take the Ten Commandments too rigidly. <laughs> so what does that mean? It means go ahead and party it up. Live in mortal sin. After all, if you're married again and divorced and remarried, no problem, come to communion. He's sending souls to hell. This is the vicar of Christ. It's frightening because Our Lady of Fatima, excuse me, Our Lady of La Salette foretold that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. Certainly they, these five last popes have promoted the Antichrist ideals, which is, which is embodied in one word, Freemasonry. The idea that all religions are equal, the, the idea you need the separation of church and state, the idea that Christ is not king, and he's just another buddy with Muhammad, Buddha, Joseph Smith, and all these phonies. So, St. John, what does he say? St. John is uh, quite, a, quite a, a, an impressive, they're all impressive, but St. John was really special to our Lord. He was the Benjamin at the supper, the last supper that put his head on the heart of Jesus. And because as a tradition of the Jews, since Moses, the Jews always did the Passover meal. And Christ did it with the apostles. And the youngest would ask the questions, why did Moses leave the Egypt? What did God do for the Israelites? And they go through the whole story. And uh, the youngest would be right next to the father. So our Lord, who was God, present, and, uh, and, and uh, consecrated his apostles as bishops, St. John was there, and he was the one that heard the heart of Jesus beating in the chest of Christ the King. And he would be the one to stay faithful, thanks to Our Lady, to the foot of the cross, to see that heart, as he says, Aperui, opened on the cross, and gushed out his last drops of blood and water on the cross. So St. John is, he's really uh, one of those one-time figures. He is the one who, these are the titles the fathers of the church give St. John. He's called Prince of Theologians because he saw theology. He saw Christ transfigured. He saw his glory. He saw in, in his his last gospel, excuse me, the last gospel of the Mass, which is the first gospel of St. John's gospel. St. John, he's the eagle. That's his symbol. Why? 
because the eagle can fly right to the sun and look with his eyes into the sunlight without being blinking or being blinded. And St. John is that as soon as his first words, because already the early church was being attacked by those, and their names are Cherinthus and Elion, old names, but suffice it to say, Cherinthus and Elion. These two were the first in the time of St. John to begin to attack, well, maybe Christ isn't God. Maybe Jesus Christ worked miracles, but he was only a prophet and not truly God. Or maybe he was an angel, like the Apocalypse calls him. Or maybe he was just the son of the Father, but not consubstantial with the Father. So these heresies started to emerge like bad weeds. And St. John the Apostle, defender, he's called, he's not a wet noodle. Some of the modern art portrays St. John as looking like a wet noodle. He's not a wet noodle. Our Lord called him son of thunder, him and his brother James. Son of thunder, because he would thunder the defense of the divinity of Jesus Christ the King. And his gospel, is, it focuses most on the divinity of Jesus Christ. And the very first words of his gospel, in the beginning was the word. Who's this word? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And this erat, this participle in the imperfect tense, means forever he was with God, from all eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with, with, was with God, and the Word was God. First, first sentence, St. John takes you right to the heart of the Blessed Trinity. And in the blinding light of who Christ really is, he is God from all eternity, the Word that proceeds from the Father, and the Word is an act of the intellect who, uh, expressed by the Father, and the act of love by the Father, knowing the Son perfectly and seeing the reflection of his, Himself in the Son, and the Son rendering back the homage and adoration to the Father, but both being equal and no beginning in time, spirate the Holy Ghost, the love, the person of love. Just, and it's reflected in all of us because we can know and you can love and you can remember. So we have the Blessed Trinity imprinted even in our rational nature. Already man is elevated above all creation just by reason. But God doesn't want to just stop there. He wants us to be impressed with the very presence of the Holy Trinity in our soul. This is sanctifying grace. Where the Holy Trinity transforms your whole being into a member of Christ's mystical body. I am the vine, you are the branches. And the, what gives life to the leaves and the branches is that they're united by the tree sap, the sap that flows through the whole vine. So if we share in that sap, that life of the Blessed Trinity, of Christ himself, that is sanctifying grace. So St. John, he wrote his gospel in the year 99. 66 years after the ascension of Christ into heaven, and then 27 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. And St. John, there was a time when St. John was the only one alive. St. Peter had been crucified upside down. St. Paul was beheaded. All the apostles had all been martyred. There was a time when it was just St. John, the only living remembrance of he who touched Christ, as he himself said, he who we listen to with our ears, who saw with our eyes and handled with our hands when he touched his wounds at the resurrection. And he said, this is the word of life. This is the verbum day, the verbum vitae, the word, eternal word, the wisdom of the Father, God who became flesh, who we saw. And St. John is, 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 he has, he's, he, he, his gospel is to convince the Catholic people of those days and for the rest until the end of the world, Christ is God. And St. John's gospel is a defense that Christ is God. That's basically what it is. And his list of miracles to prove it, the other evangelists list tons of miracles. 
St. John lists miracles that really highlight his divinity. Here's a list of them. The first is the expulsion of the sellers and buyers in the temple. Why is that a miracle? St. Jerome says it's a miracle because the police were there. The Roman police were there. Anybody messing with money is going to get arrested. And when the Jews are in charge, anybody who touches a penny out of place, they're going to be arrested. Now, Christ goes in to this whole area and flips the tables. He whips, he makes a whip with cords and whips them in the back, telling them, get out of here. You've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. St. Jerome says this was an, one of the biggest miracles because Christ held back in fear all the Roman soldiers, all the Jews. They didn't dare jump him, touch him, arrest him. Nobody dared to approach him because they really saw the anger of God. And St. Jerome says that per paralysis, that, that fear paralyzed all of them. And he said that was an incredible miracle. For St. Jerome, that's one of the best. And St. Jerome, he, he was known for getting angry and not stinting words on his enemies. <laughs> so, uh, the second miracle, the healing of the sick child of the centurion, the healing of the paralytic at the pool in the sheep market, chapter 5, giving sight to the man born blind, that's chapter 9 the famous encounter with the Jews. Chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus, four days dead. And Lazarus was raised from the dead stronger and younger. And we know this because he, he died in France. He was a bishop. He was martyred in southern France with his two sisters, St. Martha, who founded an order of nuns in southern France, and St. Mary Magdalene, who spent the rest of her years in a cave called the Cave of Baum, B-A-U-M-E, and it's uh, up in the hills of southern France, and you can still be, visit that cave. And um, chapter 18, the falling of Judas and the servants hitting the earth when they came to take and arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, Christ just said, I am he, and they all fell like a Mack truck hit them. The flow of blood and water from the side of Christ after he was dead. The power of forgiving sins given to the apostles by Christ himself after the resurrection by breathing upon them. And the multiplication of the fish for the apostles, chapter 21, when he was risen from the dead. So St. John, his whole gospel will be to defend the divinity of Jesus Christ in a time when right before his death, the devil was souping and whipping up the first attacks against the Catholic faith, which is to attack Christ and say that he's not God, he's just a man. Now this is the great sin of our modern times. The great sin of ecumenism, to pray together for peace. But God says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have, you shall not have strange gods before me. He thundered this with lightning and thunder on Mount Sinai. And St. John thunders this reality when Christ says, no one can come to the Father but through me. Without me you can do nothing. I and the Father are one. And not one in just some kind of friendship, but one in, in substance and unity of nature. The church has defended this with over 11 million martyrs who shed their blood to seal this Catholic truth. And this is what we have to be ready to die for. And this is why we're here at Mass in this house. Why? Because Vatican II dissolved Jesus Christ as God. It attacks Jesus Christ as God, as King, as Priest, as the only Savior. What more do you want to tell you it's straight from hell. What more do you need than to see the fruits of Vatican II in the new mass? Look what it's done to the Catholic faith, to the Catholic church, to the Catholic people. And souls are being sent to hell because of Vatican II, not in shovelfuls, but in bulldozer fools. Souls falling into hell, losing their faith. 
And how many novice are Catholics, if you ask them, and granted, some are of goodwill, God knows them, God judges them. We don't condemn them, but we, do, we condemn that, that horrible new mass. We condemn the errors of Vatican II. We have to, because the Church has always done so. All the good popes have, with infallible authority have condemned all the errors of Vatican II and the new mass. So, that's 50 years ago. And St. John says in his epistle, Whatever dissolves Jesus Christ is of the Antichrist. And already in his day, he's defending Christ as his divinity. St. John, uh, uh, he defends the divinity of Christ. So, any heresy down the centuries of the church who attack his divinity, it's of the spirit of the Antichrist. Vatican II attacks the divinity of Jesus Christ, it is of the spirit of the Antichrist. It's preparing for the Antichrist. The new mass has been successful to prepare whole generations of Catholics for the Antichrist. That's the great success of the new mass. That's the only thing it can boast about. It has prepared the Catholic people to lay down their weapons and slide with the world, the whole spirit of the world, including contraception, divorce, the whole abortion picture, the whole uh, ecumenism, collegiality, religious liberty, the uncrowning of Christ the King. No one fights for him anymore. So what dissolves Christ is of the Antichrist. And that's why our battle now is Bishop Filet has dissolved Christ. <clears throat> this is the one thing the one condition, the 30 pieces of silver, that even uh, Cardinal Pozzo in Rome said just a month ago. He said the one condition for the agreement with Rome and the Society of Pius X is to sign the doctrinal declaration, which Bishop Follet did in April 15, 2012. This is when especially the whole resistance rose up. And there should have been all the priests to rise up, all the nuns, all the brothers, all the faithful, because he accepted Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition. But what does the light of tradition really do with Vatican II? It condemns every bit of it. You can't interpret it in the light of tradition because it's so full of poison, of heresies that the church is condemned, such as, for example, Lumen Gentium, I think number six, which says, we Catholics adore the same God as the Muslims. Do we? They reject the Blessed Trinity. The Muslims refuse to proclaim Christ as God. They say he's a nice prophet, but not God. This is pure blasphemy. And I'm not even going to go into the horrible other crimes the Koran promotes, the most, de 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 the most depraved perversities and cruel tortures for the so-called infidels. Let them be crucified and let their hands and feet be cut off slowly is the torture for us Catholics. That's why uh, Europe is being punished by the invasion of the Muslims. <coughs> and thanks to Obama, so far, he's, he's stopping them from coming in in waves. But that is their goal. And if God permits it as a punishment for the modern apostasy, the bloodshed under the Muslim uh, attacks. So, Vatican II, dissolves Jesus Christ. Bishop Filet bit into this apple. He has dialogued with the devil. And furthermore, sad to say, the other bishops of tradition are all dancing with the new mass, excusing it, that you can go to St. Vicanda's mass, you can go to the new mass, get grace. And this is why we have to just simply stay Catholic and proclaim Christ as God he is our God. He is one with the Father and the Holy Ghost. And he cannot be diluted with false religions by ecumenism. He cannot be uncrowned by religion, false religious liberty. He is only the, the true king. And all modern governments and nations and political leaders must acknowledge Jesus Christ as God and king. And if they don't, we pray for their conversion. We pray for our President Trump who, uh, thank God, he's in, compared to the other one, 
But uh, imagine if you've seen the fangs of the devils he's dealing with and all these ferocious liberals who pretend to be all about love and nice and peaceness, and they're raising riots, threatening a man in the subway in New York City wearing a Trump hat was beat up, physically beat up. So much for the liberal peace and love and joy. And these Planned Parenthood butcheresses, they all hate Trump because he stopped the funding for international abortions. So these are good steps, which when he sees the fangs of the enemy that he's really dealing with, and he himself pulled no punches, he said, the greatest enemy is the United States people, and he's right on this because he's just actually, he's echoing what Pope Pius XI said in Pope Pius XII, the media. They are the biggest brainwashers of the American and the Western people. We drink it all in. We believe everything NBC, ABC, Fox News say. And we're brainwashed. We are the most brainwashed people in the history of the whole world. And we have at least a decent, somewhat decent president to say to these rats, the greatest enemies of the American people are NBC News, CNN, <laughs> Fox, ABC, NBC, he listed five. Oh, New York Times was the first one. Yes. It's great to hear a little bit of common sense still left among some leaders. But if they don't bow before Christ the King, he's going to also crumble. And maybe we, we must pray for that conversion. So, so, Vatican II dissolved Jesus Christ. That's why we have to just play no games with it. Stay Catholic, dear faithful. And even if Catholics remain, a, it's just a handful, says St. Athanasius, they still remain the, the, the true church of Jesus Christ. And we're not some fragment, we're not some sect, we're not some marginalized group. We are Roman Catholic. And if the Pope isn't professing the Roman Catholic faith, well, we pray for his conversion, but we wait patiently until God gives us a good Pope. And this is a part of the punishment we have to go through. And we can't even find now a bishop that professes fully the Catholic faith and doesn't play games with Vatican II in the New Mass. Show me one in the whole world that doesn't play games with it, that doesn't water down Jesus Christ to please the world. Not one. So we really are at the last flank. We really are at the last hour. But it's at the last hour that Our Lady said she's going to step in and she's going to overthrow the whole plots of the enemy and their conspiracies and the, the triumph they think they've established. She will overthrow it. And uh, she said it's going to happen. But it will be late, said Sister Lucia. It will be late. And maybe after whole nations have been blasted off the face of the earth. So, dear faithful, be strong. Resistite fortes in fide, says, says the first pope to the Catholic people. Resist ye, strong in the faith. Resist the heresies. Resist the attacks to dissolve Jesus Christ. Resist the attacks to dissolve Jesus Christ as priest by the new mass, as savior by ecumenism, the only savior, as uh, the true God by the errors of Vatican II, especially religious liberty, and, um, and his holy priesthood. The attacks to dissolve Jesus Christ as the, the eternal high priest by the new mass. The new mass attacks the priesthood of Jesus Christ. It attacks his royalty. It attacks his divinity. Really, tell me the truth. What child going to first communion like this really believes that's God? Really. That the devils have said in demonic possessions, our, one of our greatest achievements was communion in the hand because it's continual sacrilege after sacrilege after sacrilege. And if they're valid masses, if they are even, it's just sacrilege after sacrilege. <clears throat> so let us pray to the Mother of God. She was the one who stood like a morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army arrayed for battle. She stood at the foot of the cross, this tower of ivory, this beautiful 
garden enclosed, this, this refuge of us poor sinners. This she also hates heresy because she loves her divine son. She crushes modernism, she crushes Freemasonry, she crushes all the heresies. She's doing some heavy stomping with her precious little feet. She is no friend of dialogue with the communists, the socialists, with the modernists. And Archbishop Lefebvre said this about the modernists, we cannot, we cannot dialogue with these agents of the Antichrist. That's what he said. Can you picture Bishop Fillet saying that now? No, we can't dialogue with you agents of the Antichrist. No way, he's all for it. He says we want the recognition, and it's coming soon, and the only thing that's missing is the seal. So he's, he's gone. I pray for him, but he's gone. And uh, anyway, I'm going very long, pardon me. But it comes always back to this one great truth. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God, and we adore him. And this is the heart of the Catholic faith. And it's always been attacked by the enemies of Jesus Christ. But when we're close to the Virgin Mary, we will always, she forms a bulwark, she forms the castle walls around Christ as king, as priest, as the only savior, and as truly God. And notice again, St. John was so close to the Virgin Mary. At the cross, Christ gave the Virgin Mary to, Saint, to be mother of St. John, and St. John to take care of his mother. And in fact, he did. And in Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, he, you can go visit the, the, the little stone house where he lived, and, he, and the altar is there where he said Mass every day, and the Virgin Mary with him. And St. John was closest to the Virgin Mary, to the heart of Mary, as he was to the heart of Jesus. So... St. John in his epistle, oh, this is my very last point, I promise. But in his epistle he says, If anyone asks you for something, and begs you for something, give him something. Money, food, or an, or an encouraging word. But give something. And never be so cold as to refuse to give something. St. John says that. So let's use this on St. John. And let's turn to him and say, St. John, you said not to leave anyone empty-handed. Well, we turn to you. You were closest to the heart of Jesus and Mary. You were the last living apostle. You saw the apocalypse. You saw the dragons sweeping a third of the stars to hell, that is, the clergy. You saw the attacks of the devil on the church. You saw the triumph of the Virgin Mary in Apocalypse 12, the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, as in the miraculous medal. So St. John, don't leave us beggars begging. Help us. Give us the great love of God. Give us a strong faith like you had, to never compromise and go wish-wash with Vatican II and the new Mass, but to stay strong like you did, and stay virgin like you did, pure in body, but he was virgin, and also martyr. He was a martyr. He was boiled in boiling oil. He should have came out like a shriveled french fry. He came out younger and stronger, miraculously. But he won the crown of martyrdom, St. John. And he's the apostle, he's the evangelist, he's a warrior, he's a son of thunder, he's a fighter for the faith. Let's ask him right now, ask him in this Mass, St. John, we're using your words on you. Don't leave us abandoned. Help us stay close, help us stay strong and close to the Virgin Mary, strong in the faith, resisting unto death against the attacks of the Holy Catholic faith, which is a great grace for us to profess. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.